Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. Happy Friday. It's September 24th. We have Bucky's fans. Uh, raise your hand for Bucky's fans. You, yeah, everybody you, in you, the studio. You, 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 you. Yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, put your hands down. <laughs> uh, it is uh, Friday the 24th. Glad you're with us. Uh, Bucky's is a big deal here in Texas. Of course, we have a couple of locations all over the Lone Star State. Well, more than a couple. And they're building one of the biggest outside of Texas. Yeah, it'll be part of the new development located off of exit 407 and this is in Tennessee. Yep, it's in Sevier County, which is mm -hmm. eastern Tennessee. The 200 acre development will be called the 407 Gateway to Adventure is on property purchased by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. So let's see, the Sevier location will be the company's first big store in Tennessee and at more than 74,000 square feet with more than 120 fueling positions. EV changing, uh, excuse me, charging stations and a 250 foot long car wash. Now, I haven't seen a Bucky's yet with a car wash. Have you guys seen I, I haven't. That? Have you? So that's Justin? kind of the innovation there, right? Yeah. Uh, Stan Beard, the director of real estate for Bucky's, says it's not a coincidence we chose the 407 as our first big, big store outside of Texas. We will be the proverbial welcome sign at the front door of the exceptional travel experience that the Smoky, Smoky Mountains, Sevierville, and Sevier County has to offer. You won't forget your first visit to Bucky's, and it won't be your last. We are thrilled to share our over-the-top customer experience and be a pivotal part of this vision for the Gateway to Adventure. So if you're not familiar with Bucky's, it's a popular travel stop known for cleanliness, good food, and unique atmosphere in some of the cleanest restrooms on the planet. <laughs> uh, the plot of yes. land in Sevierville, Tennessee, was actually planned for a Walmart a long time ago, but the recession back in 2007 mm -hmm. killed that project. So bring in the uh, this tribe of Cherokee Indians and a big investment, and Bucky's is uh, expanding to the state of Tennessee. Yeah, it's interesting that's based in Texas and the largest one will be in Tennessee. I have a feeling we're going to get another one in oh, yeah. Texas. Bigger. We, we always have to kind of outdo, right? Of course, it's yeah, Texas. It's Texas. Everything bigger is always better. That's right. <laughs> Let's look at today's 9 at 9. The U.S. District Court of Wyoming has issued an arrest warrant from Brian Laundrie in connection with his activities after Gabby Petito's death. The massive manhunt is still underway in Florida two weeks after he was last seen alive. Meanwhile, the city of Moab in Utah is launching an investigation into how officers handled the situation caught on body camera several weeks before Gabby's death. Thousands of Haitian migrants are still in limbo here in Texas and Mexico as the Biden administration struggles to get a handle on the crisis. The U.S. has flown more than 1,400 migrants back to Haiti, but more than 3,000 migrants are still in Del Rio. This is a Biden administration envoy to Haiti has quit in protest. CDC Director Rochelle Walensky is recommending boosters for people at higher risk because of their workplace, going against the recommendation made by the agency's independent vaccine advisors. The committee voted 9-6 to six Thursday against recommending boosters for people ages 18 to 64 in high-risk work environments. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer plans to hold a procedural vote Monday on a plan to keep the government open. It is likely to fail because it also raises the debt limit. Republicans appear willing to pass a temporary government funding plan that does not involve the debt ceiling. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin filed an appeal of his conviction in the death of George Floyd. Chauvin raised 14 issues in his appeal, including the district court's handling of the motion to change the venue, motions to sequester the jury during the trial, and the motion for a continuance. More than 3 million newborn loungers from the Boppy company are being recalled, linked to the deaths of eight babies. The newborns are reportedly suffocated after rolling over or being placed in a way that made it hard for them to breathe. First time unemployment claims up a bit last week, but still hovering near pandemic lows. 351,000 people applied for unemployment help, up 16,000 from the week before. Apple's getting ready to let you put your COVID vaccine card on your iPhone. It's working on a verification system that will go beyond just taking a picture of the card and allow people to load vaccination information into the Apple Wallet app. The new iPhone 13 is in stock today as pre-orders begin shipping. The new line of iPhones do not have any major upgrades, only a slightly better camera, longer battery life, and a faster processing system, all for about the same price as the previous version. And that's today's Night at Night.
Let's go outside with live cam 902 on a fall Friday and tell you what going to a football game tonight sounds like my idea of a great Friday evening Justin. Oh, it sounds incredible weather's going to be nice again tonight. It was beautiful again this morning. Temperatures are slowly warming up and then uh, we'll see those numbers jump into the 80s a little bit later this afternoon. Right now 67 degrees after starting off in the 50s. We're at 64 in Valley 63 Rock Springs. There's a look at the next three days. We've got weekend plans. Looks awesome. 89 Saturday, 91 Sunday. A little warm during the afternoon, but mostly sunny skies and some cool mornings still. Uh, that changes a little bit as we get into next week with more moisture coming in. Want to mention again today is an air quality uh, alert day. If ozone is going to be a little bit high for those who are sensitive to that sort of thing, uh, it is uh, elevated today. So heads up. Pollen count. Ragweed. We are firmly in ragweed season now. It's at 640. It's in the high category. Molds are moderate. Fall elm, grass, pigweed all register as low. And one more look at today's forecast. Again, up around 88 degrees. We'll call it sunny. East Julie winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. We do have rain chances, though, in the seven-day forecast. We'll take a look at that and diagnose the forecast next week. Coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. And we have some lingering delays, folks. This was a vehicle fire earlier. It's in the clearing stages 10 area of uh, loop 410. Slow going in that area. We've got wreckers on the scene, but uh, trans guy telling our Stephen Cavazos a short while ago. This should be clear fairly soon. And top stories we're following this morning. A bizarre story out of the Castle Hills area. A man leads police on a chase on his bicycle. So they caught up to him early this morning near Blanco and Lock Hill Selma. It all started when police noticed some fresh graffiti on a wall at the Blanco North Shopping Center. Within seconds, apparently the suspect darted out of an alley, pedaled, pedaled right past them, carrying some sort of strange tool. Police turned on their lights, but the suspect kept going, leading them on that chase. Officers finally caught up with him near Blanco and Lock Hill Selma and took him into custody. They say he was carrying what they believe were stolen items and three cans of spray paint. Police say it, it turns out the suspect had an outstanding warrant. Now he also faces some new charges related to the chase. And new this morning, a solar alert. Authorities ask for your help finding this man they say could be in danger. This is 73 year old. Arnold Arnolfo. He was last seen in the 9000 block of Trenwood. That's on the city's northeast side. Police say he has a medical condition that requires a doctor's care. He was last seen wearing a black shirt with jeans. He also walks with a cane. If you know anything that can help find him, call the number on your screen. Very bottom there, 210-207-7660. And that name was actually Ar Arnold Gennaro, I believe. That's what our graphics said. Oh, okay. Yeah. And despite the large population of Hispanics and Latinos in San Antonio, there has been a decline of Spanish speakers throughout the generations. Some call it language assimilation. Others call it language loss. But many agree that years ago in the 50s, 60s, and even 70s, Spanish was thought to be or rather taught to be shameful. Alicia Beretta spoke to a professor at Our Lady of the Lake University about the loss of the language, but also the movement to reclaim Spanish. Dr. Maribel Larraga was born in the state of Veracruz, Mexico, but came to her mother's hometown of Harlingen, Texas at the age of 13. It's spiritual for me because I know that my grandma and my grandpa worked those fields. She learned English as her second language and now teaches Spanish at Our Lady of the Lake University. And more often than not, she says she hears testimonies like these. I don't speak it very well. That's why I feel embarrassed sometimes when I try and speak it. I don't really speak Spanish. I understand it. Like, uh, my grandma always used to talk about it at home. She says it's because Spanish became a private language out of pain and shame. They were punished at schools for speaking Spanish, or they felt uncomfortable and ashamed they were embarrassed to have a taco. A narrative younger generations know all too well. She was ridiculed a lot because it was, you know, wasn't what they wanted her to do in, you know, in school. My dad, that's his first language, but I remember him telling us that he used to get in trouble in school when he spoke Spanish, and so he just learned English, and that's what he kind of adapted to. But whether one is fluent in Spanish, can speak a couple of words, or mixes both English and Spanish in the same sentence, your language, she says, is part of your identity. In their heart, in their spirit, there's always that 
connection to their heritage, to their language. The testimonies we heard in that story are from some co some coworkers here at KSAT who identify as Latino, Chicano, or Hispanic, and I hope that for them and those with similar stories, they feel validated when it comes to their language. And for those struggling with their identity or wanting to reclaim the Spanish language, there is a way. There are several texts that dive deep into these topics. One of the scholars, Dr. Larraga, references to a lot in her class is Gloria Ansaldúa. She has a great text, Borderlands, La Frontera de New Mestiza text that examines the Latino and Chicano experience through various lenses. So this is a very uh, hot topic. Yes. Well, yeah. yeah, you guys brought this up Wednesday yes. on the new web show at 11 a.m. And you got a lot of feedback on social media. Yeah. A lot of people saying, hey, that's me. Yeah. What happened to me. So many people here in San Antonio had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And it's something that when I moved from Dallas to San Antonio back in 2010, uh, I wasn't aware that this was going on here in, in Texas, you know, this, yes. this wanting to eradicate Spanish and then now you know what people wanting to reclaim it well and and credit to you because you you told a lot of people one-on-one -on -one, hey you know what it's okay it's okay yeah. to go back and and relearn or or start for scratch yeah from scratch and it is a lot of people don't know this about me so I grew up speaking Spanish but I actually forgot my Spanish during high school years because I didn't use it sure. and it wasn't until I went to college and then studied abroad that you know I was able to reclaim my Spanish so. right so what do they always say when it comes to languages gotta use it or, or lose, lose it. it that's right yeah, that's very true all right well I love that you guys did this story thank you so much Alicia thank, thank you Alicia. right now 909 about 64 degrees and still ahead on GMSA at 9, the latest on how Bear County is doing in the fight against COVID-19 and details on how you can get money for getting the shot starting today. Uh, still ahead, a lot of unanswered questions this morning after a normal day at a grocery store in Tennessee turned deadly. The very latest on this story next in your morning headlines with our David Sears. And welcome back. It's 913 in your morning headlines. An update on that deadly shooting in Tennessee and a woman pulls in a gun at a Chipotle. A plane left dangling in some power lines and a heartfelt way to get your weekend started. David Sears is here. Good Friday morning to you, sir. I always like you to feel good as you head into the weekend. So and we appreciate it every that time story for you coming up in just a second. But first, no answer to the question as to why yet. Investigators are still trying to put it all together after a gunman went into a Kroger store in Collierville, Tennessee, and just started shooting. When it was all said and done, he killed one, wounded at least 12 others before he killed himself. When the gunman opened fire, you can only imagine the panic. Employees and customers running for cover, hiding out in offices, freezers, looking for any safe place, and then emerging to help the wounded. He shot one of my coworkers in the head, and then shot one of my one of the customers in the stomach. What seemed like a lot of gunfire in quick succession, like pow, 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 pow. And I just wanted to leave that space. I wanted to leave. This situation is going to drive fear, but we are a resilient community. Local law enforcement there in Tennessee is getting help from the FBI as the investigation gets underway. All right, let's take it to Philadelphia. You're inside of Chipotle, and yes, that is a woman, and yes, she reaches in her purse in just a second, and she's going to pull out a gun. She's not there. There it is, right there. She's not there to rob the place. According to investigators, she was peeved that the employee told her the store had to close because they didn't have enough people to work, so she needed to order her food online. That didn't go over well. She pulled the gun and said, if someone didn't make my food, there's going to be a problem. So the employee went ahead and filled the woman's order just so she would leave. The woman put the gun back in her purse, for a second, but before the employee could get her food to her, she pulled out the gun again and said, somebody better give me my food. She did get her food, left the restaurant. Police are looking for her. Yes, you are looking at an experimental biplane dangling from power lines about 25 feet above the ground. This happening in Georgia. Those lines basically saved the plane from crashing to the ground and the power company had to come save the pilot. He had to hang on and wait to be rescued for a couple of hours, but they got a harness around him and then got him to safety. You could see him holding, trying to hold his body up because he's been there for a couple hours, I know. Um, you could tell he was tired and exhausted, and I just kept praying, God, give him strength to make it out of there. Yeah! He knew where he was at, where he was from. Um, he just in a place where he couldn't get down. 
The pilot was taken to the hospital. He did have a cut on his head. The other problem, a lot of people were without power while the pilot was being rescued and they were getting the plane out of those power lines. Folks got their power back after a few hours. A witness says the plane did some loops before coming down and the cause of the crash is now under investigation. All right, let's leave you with this uplifting story of the week. Denicia Williams is alive today to tell her amazing story because of a young lady and her heart. A 17 year old Riley Malone was killed in a car crash. She was an organ donor and it just so happened that Denicia was a match for Riley's heart. Denicia got a chance to meet the loved ones of Riley and thank them for her gift and a chant for Riley's family to hear her heartbeat one more time. Hear Riley's heartbeat again. I had the same feeling the day she was born. When you receive somebody else's organ, it's one thing, but then their heart is something, you know, totally different because, you know, when you think of the heart, you think of, you know, their very essence. Every parent wants their child to grow up and make a difference in this world. And it make me cry. This young lady is our validation that our daughter made a difference in this world. Yeah, Riley making a big difference. First off, Denicia has a four year old that she can now see grow up. Riley was also a donor for three other recipients and one of those is a four year old little boy. So. Oh boy, those are always emotional for everybody. Emotional, involved. but very, I mean, what a great story. Oh, no doubt about it. So, everybody in that room, super emotionally yeah. invested in, in so, what was happening. Always good to see those stories though. Yeah. Amen. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Steph, I don't know if you know this about uh, Justin Horn, but if you listen, listen carefully in the newsroom, every once in a while he blurts out what he's going to talk about in his weather cast. <laughs> I heard something about, hey, guys, we're officially behind on rainfall for the year. Is that mm -hmm. kind of what I heard? You did, okay. yeah. I'm a stats guy. I love going through the stats. Is that nerdy? That's kind of nerdy. But no, yeah, that's, no, that's all right. Part of the job. It, it is. Yeah. Uh, and I was going through the stats this morning, and sure enough, we are now below average for the year for rainfall. This month's been a little rough for us uh, in September. We've had a couple of days where there's some rain, but it just hasn't been much, at least at the airport. Some places outside of San Antonio obviously have got a little bit more. But we're at 0.36 for the, for the month, and for the year we're at 23.63, which is just slightly below average bottom line here we need some rain and next week there are some chances i think tuesday wednesday maybe into thursday we'll have some chances so as we finish out the month hopefully we can boost this number just a little bit morning lows fantastic again this morning 57 here in town 48 kerrville 48 bernie stage it's 52 in hondo got down to 54 in rock springs just amazing. We'll see a couple more mornings like this before everything changes and humidity comes back and those numbers start to jump up. Blue skies right now. Temperature is at 67 at the airport. Calm winds. Dew point is at 54. And temperatures have made it into the 60s and even 70s now. We're up to 71. Stinson still in the 50s for places like Curvo and Fredericksburg. You're at 63 in Carrizo Springs and 66 out in Gonzales with clear skies. So I mentioned that rising humidity next week. We've got dew points in the 40s and 50s through Sunday. But by Monday, and I think Monday morning, you'll really start to feel it, that mugginess comes back. And we've got dew points in the 60s. My hope is that that will lead to some rain. Otherwise, it's just going to be sticky and somewhat cloudy. Forecast for today, up around 88 degrees. East Julie winds 5 to 10 miles per hour in sunny skies most of the day. As we get into tomorrow morning, 62. So not as cool as the last couple of mornings, but still great nonetheless. We've got head for the cure tomorrow morning. Should be really good running weather. Easterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour in mostly clear skies. Low temperatures, speaking of low temperatures, we'll see those rise too. So we're enjoying these great mornings. Saturday, Sunday will still be nice. But by the time we get into Monday and especially Tuesday, Wednesday, you'll, you'll see the morning lows rise above average. Temperatures around the country, very nice too. It's been nice no matter where you go because that front swept through uh, basically a large chunk of the United States and temperatures are in the 50s and 60s minus Phoenix, which is at 80. That's still going to be a hot spot on the map this afternoon. And there is an area of low pressure developing down there around Phoenix. They may get a little bit of rain out of this too. And this is the one that we'll be watching. It's forecast to move east slowly but surely and bring us some rain chances, as we mentioned, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Sunday, 
not much there. Monday, I'm not too convinced we're going to get a lot, but by Tuesday, there should be some better chances as this low pulls into New Mexico. And I think Wednesday and Thursday, there will be some opportunities for rain as well. So here's how it looks on the seven day forecast. Low humidity, 88 degrees today, 89 Saturday, 91 Sunday, 90 on Monday, 20% chance of rain. We boosted to a 30% chance Tuesday and then a 40% shot on Wednesday. We should bring those temperatures down uh, a little bit and it will feel oh, oh, maybe a little bit better, but humid next week, guys. All right. Well, at least we might get some rain out of that. True. Yes. Thank you, Justin. Time now is 921 and about 67 degrees right now. Still ahead on GMSA. Summer is over, so my fishing series is winding down. And here in Texas, we like big bass and we cannot lie. Uh, we're going to visit <laughs> the fishery out in East Texas where they are breeding super-sized bass for us to catch for generations to come. <laughs> Well, if you look up the word lunker in the dictionary, it means an exceptionally large specimen of something. With that in mind, it's well known that largemouth bass are among the most sought after game fish in the U.S. World class bass can be found in waters all over Texas. What if we take these supersized lunkers, share their DNA and keep bass big for generations to come? That program exists in only one state. Looking at images of Texas anglers having the best day of their lives. Each of them hooked largemouth bass weighing a whopping 13 pounds or more and donated their catches. Call it a loaner program for lunkers. Some of the biggest bass caught in Texas wind up here at the Texas Freshwater Fishery in Athens. It's like Jurassic Park for bass where giants are made. This East Texas facility with its tubes, tanks and ponds uses science to selectively breed big fish. It's called the Share Lunker Program. Kyle Brookshears oversees this Match.com for Mega Bass. Once the Legacy Class fish are brought here, and those are fish 13 pounds on a certified scale, and they're collected January, February, and March. We house them in what's called the Lunker Bunker, which is a specialized facility designed and constructed to house these trophy-sized bass. Um, then we selectively breed them. So we take them, we pair them up with Share Lunker offspring males, and then we grow out their offspring um, to two and a half to six inches and then restock them back in the public fisheries that they came from. He says in these controlled conditions, more eggs and offspring survive than in the wild. No other state has a program quite this unique. Um, several other states uh, have decided to do different ways of promoting bass fishing in their, in their fisheries, um, and that's great. But as far as doing the selective breeding of these trophy-sized fish, no other state has, has accomplished that yet. The Share Lunker program has been around since 1986. Funding provided by partners like Toyota pays for equipment used to perform DNA testing. Tests that confirm time and time again this share lunker circle of life yeah. works. Yeah. The breeding program is so successful the fishery is now seeing fifth generation descendants of some of these trophy bass. Yeah, it's definitely a great investment in our natural resources. You know, we're, we're not only are we uh, looking to the future of bass fisheries management um, and fishing in general on our public water bodies, but we're partnering with anglers in multiple ways. This is one way that our agency is able to come alongside anglers with a common goal and a common mission and really impact the future of fisheries um, for the next generation to come. All right, so any largemouth bass over eight pounds or 24 inches qualifies for the Texas Share Lunker program. Check out the cell phone video. Local fisherman Chris Shipman caught this 11 pounder south of San Antonio oh. back in March. Anglers like Chris get a cool little kit for submitting data on their catch, which becomes part of the state database. Look at that fish. Wow. Go to TexasShareLunker.com for more information. And that is a Catch of a lifetime, Chris, congratulations to you. Thanks to Texas Parks and Wildlife and the fine folks at the Freshwater Fishery in Athens for their hospitality. It is worth a trip to visit, especially with your kids. Look for this story and more on ksat.com. Well, that's pretty neat. Yep, and we're gonna round out my series. I'm actually seen on video fishing. I can't promise I'm catching, but fishing. <laughs> and I look for that in the weeks to come. Well, none of the large, large bass. Could you try again? I didn't say anything to you, Siri. <laughs> oh. Siri, okay. Siri, stay out of this. A lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. She wants to go fishing. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Amid the billion dollar cost of the winter freeze and thousands of customers struggling to pay their bills, CPS Energy is focused on a plot of land downtown and what to do with it. The story after the break. 
And do you know your family's story? If not, if you'd like to learn more about it, we have tips on getting started and it has to involve, or it actually involves the Seguin Public Library. And another big night and weekend in football, a preview of the matchups later with David and RJ. To the pandemic now, Mayor Ron Nierenberg says COVID conditions are slowly improving here in Bear County, but we can't let our guard down. Let's take a look at the latest numbers. There are 571 new cases in Bear County. Our seven day average is 595. 820 people in the hospital, 289 in ICU and 158 on ventilators. City health officials report 22 more deaths. Nearly one and a half million people are now fully vaccinated here in Bear County. And here in San Antonio, today is the first day some people will be able to get their COVID-19 booster shot. In addition, people in San Antonio and Bear County being offered an incentive to get their first shots, their regular vaccines. People eligible for the COVID booster shot include those who are 65 or older or people who are 18 and older and are at a high risk of severe COVID infection due to underlying health conditions. The site is located at... Uh, the upper level of Wonderland Mall opens in about 30 minutes at 10 a.m. They're open until 6 tonight. And as for the people who have not gotten their vaccine yet, Metro Health is offering a $100 gift card for those people as well. If you are interested, here's what you need to know. Metro Health says gift cards will be given to individuals receiving either one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the second dose of Pfizer or Moderna at any Metro Health site. Okay, and anyone who's fully vaccinated for today's date, not eligible for the incentive, unfortunately. Metro Health says people who are getting a third dose because of those moderate severe immunosuppressions are also not eligible for the gift card. And those who are 12 and 17 must be with a parent or guardian to receive that $100 gift card. We got down to the fine print for you there. And new details this morning. Should CPS Energy trustees just give away several acres of prime downtown real estate? That's a question CPS leaders are focused on as they deal with the billion dollar cost of the winter freeze and tens of thousands of customers behind on their bills. CPS Energy has nearly seven acres next to the San Antonio Museum of Art that it declared surplus back in 2015. You can see it here on the map behind us. The company had planned to split the property in half, give the southern portion of the museum while selling off the northern part but CPS Energy the Museum could not finish the deal by 2019 deadline and it did not go through. Now Garrett Barringer tells us the board is considering if that's still the right way forward. And over here was the cafeteria. On the corner of Camden Street and West Jones Avenue sits seven acres of now unused CPS Energy property. The southern half hasn't been given to the San Antonio Museum of Art as planned yet, nor has the northern half of the property been sold. The question CPS Energy trustees face now is what to do next. And to give anything away would be really counterproductive to a business strategy. Anthony Edwards is a former CPS executive, an honorary trustee for the museum, and a current member of the Utilities Rate Advisory Committee. He's also strongly in favor of the utility selling all of the property, not just half of it, given the financial straits the utility and its customers are in after the ongoing pandemic and the freeze in February. That includes an almost certain rate increase. What might have been seemed to be appropriate at the time just not does not fit in today's reality. The utility's chief administrative officer also says things have changed since trustees first decided to give part of the land away. In 2015, we were in a very healthy financial condition. Obviously, now we are facing challenges. We have customers with more than $100 million in, in payment arrears that need help. Uh, we have challenges um, with, the, with the winter storm URI outcome. Lewis didn't provide an estimate on the market value, though county appraisals put the location at about $11 million per half. It's in a prime location. Just on the other side of the highway is the Pearl, and on the northern half of the property, you've got the developed Riverwalk. It will be the Board of Trustees' decision on how to proceed, whether to give part of the property away or sell all of it. They're scheduled to discuss it on Monday. And that was Garrett Berenger reporting. Taking a look outside with live cam, we're at 68 degrees. Things are kind of warming up, but it's still kind of nice out there. It still feels good for now. It, it will feel okay this afternoon. We will get into the upper 80s just like yesterday with a lot of dry air. Beautiful sunrise this morning. We appreciate the pictures as always on KSAC Connect. This is just one of many, but the Silvas sent this in out near Alamo Ranch. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you too. That's a great way to start the day with a beautiful sunrise like that. 
Temperatures right now 57 in Comfort, still 59 in Kerrville. We're up to 70 though in Gonzales, Stinson up to 71, 67 in New Valley. So just warming up. Let's talk football. We got more games tonight and more perfect football weather. We'll see clear and beautiful skies. Southeast Chile winds 5 to 10 miles per hour in the sunset. Be around 728 kickoff 80 degrees by halftime though in 70s. It is perfect to sit in the stands and by the end of the game probably into the 60s. We do have some rain chances to talk about. Hopefully some beneficial rain next week. Another look at that seven day forecast is coming up in just a few minutes guys. Thank you. How well do you know your family tree? The Scheme Public Library can help you find your Hispanic roots in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month. And Sarah Costa spoke with the organizer about how to get started and the importance of knowing your Hispanic storyline. Um, your average Mexican American from the San Antonio area, you know, your average Hispanic. Mara Benitez didn't think there would be much to her Hispanic family tree, but when she started learning more about her genealogy, she says it not only made her more proud of where she comes from, but realized her family had a story. Like that her last name used to be Benito before as Benitez and that both sides of her family have links to one town in Mexico generations back. I didn't realize I had generations of rich history in that one specific town until I did this research. And so that's kind of what I want everybody to get out of this class, that you have your story and it's, it's just out there for you to find. You just have to go looking for it. It's why Benitez is teaching a Find Your Roots class at the Seguin Public Library on September 30th in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month. She says in the class you will learn what to look for and how to get past certain roadblocks. She says a lot of Hispanic family history can get lost or forgotten, and it's important to research and learn it. A lot of history is just, we don't know it just because it's not written in a textbook. And mainly that's because we, it's just lost. In a country like America, the majority of us are immigrants. So how do you get started? Start with what you know or talk to someone who knows. For example, I called my mom. She gave me names of people three generations back. We were able to find four generations back online. Benita says knowing your own history as a Hispanic is important because the word Hispanic really is an umbrella term, saying Hispanic covers so many different countries and backgrounds. All of them bring their own flavor into the word Hispanic, so it kind of helps round out that and knowing exactly where you come from, what all of your personal history is, all of your personal culture is, and where that comes from. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. The Find Your Roots class will be held September 30th from 6 to 7.30 at the Seguin Public Library. It's free to register. Go to ksat.com. And we want to remind you, the 8th annual Head for the Cure 5K Run and Walk. It's happening tomorrow, and hundreds of runners will lace up their sneakers or hit the road virtually to help raise awareness about brain cancer and raise money for research. Brain cancer hits thousands of families every year, including one of our own here at Case at 12. We lost our late news director, Jim Boyle, to brain cancer in early 2014. And after a virtual event last year, this year there's an option to run in person. So it starts at 8 a.m. at Providence High School. For more information on how to participate or donate, you can head over to kset.com slash community. And I'll be there, and David will be out there. And I want to thank Mark for his donation to my, my page. Um, and also viewer uh, Hector Sanchez, thank you so much. You're welcome, and good luck tomorrow. Thank you. 940, about 70 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. Houston Texans fall to the Carolina Panthers and a big matchup between Texas and Texas Tech happening this weekend. Your sports headlines after the break. And welcome back. It's almost 944. It is week five of the high school football season and we have a big conference showdown between my Texas Longhorns and Texas Tech. David is back with RJ to break down the weekend, look ahead to the start of conference play, also for Texas A&M. Hey guys, good morning. Yeah. You know, she just said, my Texas Longhorns and Texas Tech. <laughs> now she said that. Did you, did you catch that? I did, yes. Yeah, I, I should have yeah. said David's Texas Tech. I'm surprised you didn't She's throw a hook on My there. Texas Longhorns and Texas Tech. <laughs> no hook them, not yet. All right. Maybe she's saving that right. bragging rights later. We're going to start with high school football, though. Had a couple of big games last night to get things started. Smith and Valley won. They're like 5 and 0. Oh. Yeah, Smith and Valley 5 and 0. Oh, and Taft, uh, yeah, yeah, Taft, Justin's uh, new favorite quarterback in the area, Justice Hurt, led a uh, big touchdown drive down at the end to keep the Red, not the Red Raiders, the Raiders, the Taft Raiders. <laughs> See, here. Got, got yeah, that on I the brain. Now. My mind. Yeah. So tonight, man, some big games right here. We are still having teams undefeated play mm -hmm. each other. 
So we like that five weeks into the season. So there's Brandeis and Johnson. That's our big game, big game coverage. That's where uh, you and I are going to be tonight. We're going to be at Heroes tonight, yeah, yeah for our like pregame party, getting ready, talking with those fans, boosters, bands, all the fun out there at Heroes tonight. A couple other big games for you tonight. Steele is taking on Wagner. Elsewhere around the city in South Texas, Burbank and Breckenridge. That ought to be a pretty good game tonight, too. There's a lot riding on the line as district play is underway. Sam Houston and Edison. Mm -hmm. And a couple more to show you, Lanier and Kennedy and El Campo yeah. and Bernie Champion. There's just a few of the big games. Of course, there's the games that are on our uh, website mm -hmm. and the games that are we're going to be live streaming and then we'll be out at uh, Heroes, like you said. Yeah, La so, Lanier, the Volks, the Volks unbeaten. Also, uh, you mentioned Burbank. They came back last week, beat Edison in a close game. So this is going to be a really fun district between uh, the Edgewood schools there, Kennedy and the SAISD schools. This should be fun. And Bernie Champion taking on El Campo. Uh, that's out in Wharton County, David. Yeah. I have to look that up. <laughs> Bernie Champion challenging themselves here before district play. So that'll be a good one. So that's high school football on a Friday night. So that kicks off the weekend. Powered by Davis Law Firm. Oh boy, do we have to do this? <laughs> Are we doing this yeah. now? We yeah. should have done this like at yeah. the end. Never mind. We're all right. So yeah. Davis Mills got the start, yeah. and so uh, Carolina is like, okay. Well, look at this. Watch this. Zip, zip, de doo da. Yeah, bad actually. Down. So this you game like was, like was actually Mark? on last like night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was on. It was on uh, the uh, NFL channel. Yeah, uh, I, you know, we'll find out to see how many people actually watch this thing. Uh, Texans, uh, they are in a little bit of trouble here. Davis, Davis Mills, as you mentioned, David, a rookie, got his first start, only threw for 168 yards. Not good. The Texans, in general, less than 200 well, yards total offense. Yeah, they had 44. Yards in the first half, mm -hmm. and I was I was kind of questioning because you know every now and then I'll question something that a coach will do <laughs> once in a while. Just a and it's like why do you keep running the ball on first and second down through the whole game trying to protect your quarterback and then put him in a position where he gets third and eight, right? And then yeah. he gets sacked because they rush him with nine guys. It's like that. I just I didn't understand that, but I wasn't there to ask about it. So you know, oh well. <laughs> uh, Let's so, get to the fun yeah, stuff. Texans Shall fall we? to Panthers, 24-9. They Let's are at get Buffalo. To the fun stuff. Next. And this really cost the Panthers. They lost Christian McCaffrey to a yeah. injury. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of a that's big deal for that's them. That's not the fun stuff I was talking about. <laughs> I know. Let's get to the fun day. Oh, look yeah. at that. Yeah. Look going. at that. Great shot to start off with. Do <laughs> you know the entire Texas fight song? Do I? Yeah. Uh-oh, uh challenge. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> okay. She may have to sing that after yeah. this weekend. We'll All right, so tomorrow morning, 11 a.m., it's mm -hmm. Texas Tech. Matt Wells, this could go a long way in getting a lot of people off his back because he hasn't exactly set the world on fire as the head coach <laughs> of Texas Tech in his third year. But he's 3-0 going to this one, so this could, uh, Tech's got a better running game than they've had in the past. They've got a better okay. rush defense than they've had in the past. Yeah. And Texas has got Bijan. Bijan, yes, yeah, that's the goal right there. Contain Bijan so, Robinson for yeah. the Red Raiders. This game in Austin, and it's the conference opener. So always, yeah. always a great matchup anytime uh, UT takes on Tech. And that game is actually going to be on KSAT 12 tomorrow yep. morning, 11 a.m. And you know, Texas and Texas Tech are going to continue their series even after Texas leaves and goes to the SEC. Oh. How about that? Okay. All right. Good Friends forever. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, and Speaking of rivalries, here we go. It's forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, Arkansas and A&M in Jerry's world. Does yes. it get much better than that outside yeah. of Texas and Texas Tech? Is it any better than yeah, Arkansas? Yeah, uh, both these schools, both unbeaten. And Justin, I have a question to ask you. Nine-game yeah. winning streak for Texas A&M versus Arkansas. Does that scare you? Uh, no. No? Oh, no. okay. You know, what's interesting is all, all the quote-unquote experts are picking Arkansas to win this game, it feels mm. like. So I, I take the pressure off a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, they did whip up on Texas a couple weeks ago. They sure so did. That's, that's yeah, they probably sure a lot of them. Hey! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, that game is at 2.30 from Jerry World. Yeah, uh, and then uh, UTSA Roadrunners. Now, how about this ball club? Ooh. Yeah, looking for the first 4-0 start in program history. Uh, they're an underdog here against Memphis. Memphis is undefeated as well. And here's my thing. If UTSA wins this game, then I think they have a good shot to really – have a special special season well i think if uh, trailer was really thinking about what's going on he left the ticket for elvis <laughs> <laughs> you know what knowing jeff trailer he probably he has already have. thought about that yeah that he game is have. at the liberty bowl that's at 2 30 on espnu all right so probably see the runners it. pull that one out. david rj thank you guys right. yeah, have a good weekend you too, you too. You too. See you get soon. your guns up yep uh horns up <laughs> See you tomorrow at the we're, race. We're checking the tropics with oh, yeah. uh, meteorologist Justin Horn. Monday's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at the tropics. We've got a hurricane out there now, guys. Sam out in the Atlantic. Winds are at 75 miles per hour. This is a rapidly strengthening hurricane. You can see it pretty clearly. 
uh, down there uh, in the Atlantic out over open water right now. Guster at 90 miles per hour. It's moving west at 14 miles per hour and uh, it'll continue to move very slowly and uh, it will become a major hurricane. We think winds could go as high as uh, 130 miles per hour and uh, becoming a, a category four storm staying a major hurricane. But thankfully it looks like right now it'll stay north of the islands. We'll see how that plays out. We have some time to watch it. Let's go outside right now. We've got the uh, blue skies and the temperatures at 67 degrees 71 at Stinson 69 Kelly and 64 at Randolph with uh, light winds across the board and uh, temperatures around the area in the 60s and 70s for the most part 71 Stinson 66 New Braunfels 67 Canyon Lake 62 right now comfort 67 out in Tarpley and 70 increase those springs. It was a great start. Temperatures in the 50s and 40s. Now we're transitioning into the 60s and 70s, and I think a lot of us will be in the 80s this afternoon. Now, dew points are up just a little bit from where they have been into the 50s, but that still puts us squarely in the pleasant range. I don't think they get any higher than what you see right now today, so it uh, stays pretty comfortable humidity-wise. Temperatures make it up to about 88, and then we'll see those numbers slip down into the 70s and eventually 60s this evening. If you have plans this evening, it is going to be perfect to be outside. And that's the case tomorrow morning too. 61 to start your Saturday. Head for the cure. We mentioned it earlier. Perfect running weather for those who are headed out to that event. We hope you'll join us tomorrow morning for that. Uh, looking at the setup, we have a departing system here. Still showers and storms lining up across the northeast. Uh, that has brought some heavy rain there, but it is moving out. And then you'll notice there's a little bit of rain across the desert southwest. This is the storm system we're going to watch for next week because it does up here that it will bring in some moisture to Texas. Now, that being said, these cutoff lows are notoriously hard for these models to kind of figure out. So there's still a few questions here as to exactly where it will track and just how much rain it will bring us. But I do think that by Monday we'll start to see a few showers and Tuesday into Wednesday as this gets a little bit closer. It's not going to move over top of us. It's going to miss us to the west a little bit, but it should bring some better chances of rain right now. I'm thinking 30 to 40 percent chance. There could be a few pockets of heavy rain depending on the exact movement of this low. So stay tuned. Stay tuned to the KSAT weather app. We're going to continue to send out updates. In the meantime, low humidity through Sunday. There are the rain chances. 30% Tuesday, 40% on Wednesday. We'll be right back. Good morning. Coming up on live, Liza Koshi from My Little Pony. I love My Little Pony. And also we've got uh, Fall Bargains with Monica Mangan and Record Breaker Week continues. Hey, an update, the silver alert we told you about at the beginning of the newscast has been canceled. Arnolfo Arnold de Hineta Valencia has been found safe, we are happy to say. And just a reminder, the Head for the Cure 5K that's happening tomorrow morning is right across the street from our KSET studios at Providence High School. We hope to see you there. It kicks off at 8. Justin will be there. David Sears will be there. I'll be there. We're trying to keep up with you, Steph. Oh, I think it'll be the other way around, I think. I think so. But it's all for a good cause, so I hope to see you guys there and have a great weekend. Steph's going to set the pace. Yes, you will. I don't know about that. Have an awesome <laughs> weekend. Thanks for watching, everybody. Our news crews will see you back here at noon.